Good evening. Welcome to the uh, 25th of October program, the third program of this year, which is our 32nd year of uh, uh, doing topics on World War II history. Could the World War II veterans in the audience please stand up and be recognized? The World War II veterans. What, what unit were you in, sir? Navy Air Corps. Navy Air Corps. Uh, on uh, a, a carrier or? No, we were, uh, we were attached to different ships that uh, we did, went through all the islands, Saipan, Guam. We even went and saw Nagasaki and Hiroshima about a month after. So we got to see a lot. Thank you for, this is your first time, right? No. Oh, I missed you then. Yes. Be sure and sign him up. I, I'm, I'm always looking for veterans for programs. I'm going to introduce our speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Kim Monholland. Did, did Harold hire you? Yeah. I, I thought you were one of the, uh, one of the last of the- he became chair of the department Harold became chair of the department and he didn't want to teach 20th century Europe. He wanted to teach World War II. And so that was his one class and I took over the 20th century Europe one. And, and, you, and, you, per, and you, you bring another question. How many people in the audience took Harold Deutsch's World War II history course? I, I think that's marvelous. How many people took his course? There, there's, there's, there, uh, uh, was he your advisor for your PhD? He was one of them. I was one? on the board. <laughs> okay. And I, I, I saw Mr. Olson there. Yeah, good. Good idea. Yeah. But uh, Kim is a California guy, uh, graduated from Stanford, spent some time in the Air Force, uh, then got his master's PhD at Princeton was hired by Harold Deutsch, we just found out, and uh, has become an expert in, uh, in uh, French history. Uh, I, I know one of the trips that we took to uh, Paris, uh, we were trying to connect up with Kim. I think at one time you used to have a, a, a flat there in, in Paris, right? Well, whenever I'd have leave, we would rent a place. Rent a place, yeah. yeah. But, uh, uh, but as I was reading over his uh, bio, uh, one thing caught my eye. He was involved in a book called Wine and War. And apparently he's an expert on French wine. Maybe, that, may, maybe, that, maybe that's a uh, topic of a, uh, of a drinking session, at least, that we should uh, consider down the road. But uh, uh, we're, we're so proud to have you here. And uh, uh, when... when uh, <clears throat> when we were doing the planning on this, I sent an email, and there were a couple of days uh, lag in the uh, reply, and uh, Kim had been giving lectures for the Smithsonian on their tours in, in Europe. So, Kim, welcome to the Harold Deutsch Roundtable, and uh, we, we're so proud to have you here. Thank you. Professors never learn new tricks. They just repeat the ones they've learned from somebody else, you see, and this is my outline. We always have to start a class with an outline, otherwise you won't know where we're headed. So what I'm really doing today, um, your speaker was supposed to talk about the impact of World War I on France, and that is my specialty, so I will be talking about that. But my main theme is really how much this war cost. And that's not just France. It's, of course, Germany, but it's also a war that was truly global. I'll explain that later on, even though most of the action was, of course, in Europe, and then the United States entering in in 1917 uh, to join the Allies then against Germany uh, 
uh, and that's how the war then eventually <laughs> came, uh, uh, came to an end. So uh, what I'm going to do is look at what I call the legacy of the Great War. And uh, the second uh, part of the outline is what was the price of victory. Uh, that is to say, uh, we know what the Germans lost as a result of the war. They had to pay enormous reparations. Uh, the economic cost was disastrous. They ultimately went through uh, a, a terrible inflation in 1923 that virtually ruined the economy, which meant the next time an economic crisis came around during the Depression, uh, the Germans were uh, greatly weakened, and we know what they did to try to solve uh, that uh, problem. Less well known is one of the winning powers, France, also paid a heavy price for that war, and that's kind of going to be my uh, major theme uh, here, but everyone in the globe, this was truly a world war, even though all the action was mainly in Europe and to some extent the Middle East, uh, but I'm going to give you a little view of the Pacific, which is where, of course, uh, New Caledonia is located, um, which also the Pacific makes France the second largest maritime power in the world. Because if you take the 200 economic, uh, uh, economic development zone around every island, well, the French have got a lot of islands out there, and they are, after the United States, the second largest economic power in the world. Now, uh, of course, they're getting chased by the Chinese right now, because the Chinese find an atoll converted into an island, and then they get 200 miles all the way around those new um, developed uh, uh, islands that have taken place. That's another topic, though, and uh, it's going to be uh, inter interesting uh, results. But the other thing which is uh, on this then uh, were the losses of German territory in Europe itself, uh, the uh, imbalance in global balances that I'll tell you. Uh, I have to warn you, I'm going to give you some statistics. I'm going to quiz you on them. Uh, and uh, therefore, you know, uh, uh, this is going to be it. And I will focus then uh, upon what happened to France uh, uh, when they won uh, one war uh, and then lost very badly. Uh, in the Second, uh, uh, Second World War. So any questions, any specific things you might like to, like to hear about in this sort of uh, tour we're going to have? Okay, let me see now if I got the right one. Okay, this is the victory celebration in World War I. Uh, As you can see, it's an allied victory celebration with the Americans, the French, uh, the British, uh, all showing up then to dance in the streets of Paris. Uh, and that was where then the um, uh, victory, uh, or I should say the settlement of the war, known uh, rather uh, specifically as the Treaty of Versailles, which was really only the treaty with Germany as such. There were other treaties that got in here with the Ottoman Empire, etc. Uh, and so that uh, was uh, it. Now, it's often described as the um, big four. Uh, and here is uh, Woodrow Wilson right next to his pal, if that's the word for it, Clemenceau, uh, uh, Lloyd George, and uh, Orlando of, uh, of Italy. Uh, uh, Clemenceau once said famously, uh, you know, Woodrow Wilson talks like Jesus Christ, but he, talk, he behaves like Lloyd George. And uh, that was kind of uh, their relationship uh, uh, diplomatically uh, at this uh, point. But there was, and this is uh, what I'm going to try to put some emphasis on, a Japanese delegation. 
And the Japanese were, of course, uh, among the victors in the war. They didn't get what they wanted, namely a statement against racism and certain territories in China that they had their eye on. They would make up for that a little bit later on in another uh, uh, war. But this then became the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Uh, this is kind of a formal um, uh, painting of that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, event. Uh, and now let me go very quickly through what were the consequences. First of all, Germany in defeat. There had been a previous war between France and Germany of 1870-71. And uh, the uh, uh, Germans imposed two things on the French. One was a very substantial reparations uh, payment. So it's not surprising that the French would come up with that idea. Uh, but then they lost their territory um, of Alsace-Lorraine, which is located right here, Strasbourg as the main city. Uh, but they also insisted that they needed to have space to face the Germans if war should come in the future. So they had a demilitarized zone, which I'll show you in more detail later on, along the border uh, and extending approximately 30 miles um, uh, to the uh, east of the Rhine River. So the Rhineland itself uh, was uh, demilitarized here. Anyway, this is what uh, was the territorial loss that Germany had to endure then along the uh, western border. They lost some land to Belgium uh, as well. But the real losses were in the east, then uh, uh, in uh, uh, what was formerly Prussia, uh, Pomerania, and that area. I'm really having trouble with this little devil. We're missing a battery, but so you'll have to use uh, some imagination here. Uh, uh, much of what had been uh, um, Eastern Germany uh, was now uh, then given up to the smaller states that were created out of the Austro Hungarian uh, and the uh, German Empire itself. Uh, and portions of what had been the Russian Empire, which was, of course, now uh, under Bolshevik, um, uh, Bolshevik control. So those are the main losses, but for our purposes, uh, what we really want to look at is in detail, then, this strip of uh, territory uh, along the Rhine River. The French then were convinced that if the war were fought, it would not be like World War I, which was fought mainly on French toy soil, but uh, on the valley of the, uh, of the Rhine. So that was their uh, security blanket, if you want, uh, held up then against uh, uh, the possibility of uh, a recovered, um, uh, recovered Germany. Um, here then is the territorial rearrangement for all of Europe itself. Uh, uh, the uh, great empires, uh, Austro-Hungarian, Russian, and uh, German then uh, were the losers, and the new smaller states of Eastern Europe uh, emerged uh, from this. Now, what's the consequence for that? Right now, we're looking back at this particular period. There are a number of history, histories about this middle ground between Berlin and Moscow. And what happened in these areas where democracies were tried out, but they didn't last. So that by the time you get to 1919, or when you start at 1919, leaving out the Soviet Union, virtually 94% of the states of uh, Europe are in some form of representative government. Now that's not democracy, technically speaking, but it is representative government. So uh, it looks as if maybe uh, Wilson got his way and this was a war uh, to make the world free for, um, for democracy. But it didn't last very long. If you look down the line in 1939, there is only one 
major democracy left in Europe, and that is France, on the continent. The small countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, yes, Scandinavia, yes, but basically on the continent, um, uh, leaving aside the two small powers, everything east of the Rhine River is an authoritarian form of government, one kind or the other, ranging from uh, 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 fascism to uh, just simply authoritarianism of one kind uh, or, uh, or another. Now, many of my colleagues are busy at work on this, even in our retirement, to figure out what the hell happened. Uh, the easy explanation is that it was the Depression, but the trouble is you look into the 20s and already uh, authoritarianism is prevailing uh, over a good deal then of that shaded portion, East Prussia, yeah, but all the way into Poland uh, as a state that emerged from the ruins of uh, the uh, uh, war itself. So that's one uh, 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 issue. The other is that they divided up the old empires. And here I'm going to come back to the Pacific, not just because New Caledonia is there, but of course it is. Uh, but uh, uh, who were the beneficiaries then of the division of the um, uh, uh, German Empire in the Pacific? And, and here uh, north of the equator, it would be Japan as a major beneficiary. To a lesser extent, Australia uh, uh, gained territory as a result uh, of this. If we move on to the Middle East, the Ottoman Empire has been parceled out. We're living with that map today, uh, not very successfully, but it's there. Uh, and uh, that is, again, a major consequence, then, uh, of the war. Then the German African Empire is also parceled out, mainly between the British and the French, who are the main beneficiaries there. The Belgians did all right themselves, but basically uh, this is a division of a continent then, uh, although Wilson was thoroughly opposed to imperialism. Uh, the fact of the matter was that these mandates were imperialistic devices then for how they ruled and governed then uh, these, uh, uh, these territories. Now we get into the grim details. The war dead, and here the Germans lost 1.8 million people, uh, men mainly, and the French lost only 1.4. But the problem here is the French had fewer people to deal with than did the Germans, so uh, that they were, uh, by um, uh, a proportion, the greatest losers of manpower as a result uh, of, um, uh, of the war. Austria-Hungary existed no more, but there were uh, fights on the border between Austria, Rump, and uh, Hungary, Rump, uh, uh, in the aftermath then uh, of, uh, uh, of the war. And now if you look at the uh, box to the lower left with the losses of the United States, relatively light, comparatively speaking, but that's a little bit deceiving because if you go to the um, uh, um, uh, 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 cemeteries, uh, particularly on the, uh, near Verdun, you will see that over a smaller period of time, the Americans were losing people at the same rate as were the Europeans. It's just that we didn't have as much time to lose uh, these people. So there is the war dead uh, as a high price that is, um, uh, is to be paid. And here is Katie Kolwitz's um, uh, etching of the uh, people who paid that price but were not the soldiers. That is, the civilian population also psychologically and uh, physically uh, suffered an enormous loss then uh, as a result uh, of, uh, uh, of the war.
Now we go on to the losses in gold. And here, uh, the um, uh, lesson to be learned, which the Swiss learned it long ago, it pays to be neutral. That is to say, you have to buy goods from the neutral states. You have to buy supplies, foodstuffs even. Uh, and this then benefited uh, those who were able to loan money to fight wars. And here we get then the gold gains of uh, uh, 1917, 18. There is about 218 uh, uh, pounds that the, uh, 218 million pounds, I should say, that the Americans gain by the war. But then you can see Argentina, which was selling goods to the British. Um, as Spain was neutral. They did all right. Australia did all right. But look up above Australia, and the number for Japan is roughly what? About 183 uh, million. Uh, and these are British pounds, which are about uh, uh, it takes four dollars uh, and 85 cents uh, at that time uh, to get a pound. So this is a lot of money that's there. In fact, if you look at Japan per capita, they are the biggest gainers financially out of the war. So they not only get the German territories in the Pacific, but they also made money mainly off of the British Empire, uh, which had to sell or buy goods and uh, uh, that sort of, uh, sort of thing. So these are little elements of the impact of World War I that we often don't really see. Namely, the rise of Japan is underway, even though they feel, felt uh, uh, insulted by the fact that the big four would not really let them uh, take a major seat uh, at, the, uh, at the conference, um, uh, conference table. And here then, we have debts to the United States. Again, it paid to be neutral, at least up until 1917. Uh, and here the major debtor nations are uh, uh, France, uh, uh, Great Britain, uh, some of the former states of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, and of course uh, the Russians. But if you thought the Bolsheviks were going to pay that debt, then I've got a bridge in Brooklyn that I'll sell you at a very good price. Uh, uh, that just didn't, uh, wasn't in the, in the works. But now let's get to the basics between France um, and Germany. Here are sort of population pyramids to show you where the uh, 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 thing is there. If you'll go up to the very top, you'll see on the male side of the pyramid that there is a terrible gap. And that reflects the numbers of men who lost their lives as a result of the war. Uh, on the female side of the pyramid, you'll see that, again, the women have a more or less normal uh, uh, longevity projected here. But if you go down a little ways to the middle, and you'll see that there's a gap on both the male and female side. Why was that gap? Children who weren't born during the war. So here again, we see that the French proportionately lose a great deal uh, 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 to the war. Furthermore, it meant that the women on the right-hand side were now the breadwinners. And they often faced severe poverty because the veterans' benefits were far lower than what the uh, veteran lost uh, would be earning or uh, being paid uh, in, that, uh, in that way. So what we have are these two holes on uh, either side. Now, if you make a comparison with the Germans, you can see the gaps. 
on the male female side of the French pyramid on the left. There is a gap on the German side, but it's not as big. And so what this would mean in the long run through the interwar period, and by the time you get to 1939, there are more Germans of draft age available to Hitler's army uh, than there are to the French. What I think you can see from these outlines that however heavy the German losses were in manpower, they were far deeper, uh, not only in manpower, but in woman power as well on the French side. So this meant that the French throughout the interwar period knew they had a problem. And so part of French politics was try to encourage then a higher birth rate. Uh, in 1870, uh, the old saying was, well, 40 million Frenchmen can't be wrong. In 1939, they're the same 40 million Frenchmen. So this has the various gaps that uh, are, uh, are created here. And even if you look down towards the bottom, you'll see little chunks. This is the uh, grandson effect or granddaughter effect uh, as well uh, in, uh, in the losses. Now, just to editorialize on the side a little bit, the Soviets faced the same thing after World War II, and we never really understood the problem then that they had in terms of manpower available uh, to fight whatever kind of war uh, they might decide uh, to, uh, to fight. So the French then began to try to push to encourage the birth rates. And this then uh, was made more acute uh, by the fact that many of the returning veterans were so badly harmed and badly wounded that they were hardly effective as uh, 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 money winners, farmers, whatever else they might um, uh, have in mind. And then, of course, the French uh, put out propaganda uh, I like this one with the two um, uh, babies in bassinets up here on the upper right-hand side. Uh, of course, there's this monstrous German in his uh, spiked helmet uh, about to bash to death uh, the poor little innocent French uh, baby then uh, right, uh, uh, right next door. Or there were then uh, 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 images created to show then the loss of life uh, in the countryside. And that was a serious problem for the French because many villages came back and were deserted. That is, they didn't come back. Uh, and this was another part of the problem that the French had uh, uh, in mind. Now there's one rather artistic thing, and here I wrote about this one about uh, Monet and uh, uh, Clemenceau. Monet had spent the war years uh, on his estate at Giverny, and uh, at the end of the war, he called up his pal Clemenceau. They used to roam around the countryside together. Uh, he uh, uh, called up his cal, uh, pal uh, Clemenceau. He says, I'd like to donate something as my gift to the French nation. And his gift were the water lilies that are now installed in the Orangerie uh, in, uh, uh, in Paris. Uh, and uh, this is what we've got uh, as Clemenceau's legacy to the war. But Clemenceau uh, had a problem with cataracts. There's a Stanford ophthalmologist who's figured out what he could really see and he couldn't find the yellows. He had to get told where the yellows were, and then he would paint with the yellows. But he had his cataracts. It was a success. He was able to see yellow again, uh, but he uh, uh, had trouble giving up uh, these masterpieces that he saw uh, as the climax of his life's work. Finally, and this is wonderful uh, 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 letters back and forth between uh, Clemenceau 
and, uh, and uh, Monet. And Clemenceau wrote him a letter and he says, I don't care how great an artist you think you are, you owe this to the French people and by God, you're gonna have those cataract, uh, excuse me, have those cataract operations uh, or I'm coming down there and do it myself. Uh, so that was the nature of their uh, relationship. And finally then, after Monet died, Clemenceau supervised the installation uh, of the water lilies then in the uh, orangerie. Now, where else? Well, the war was over, and the French did decide to celebrate that end of the war. Here on the left uh, is the celebration up in Montmartre, which became the kind of uh, uh, fun capital, or fun uh, arrondissement of uh, France. Uh, they, of course, went back to drinking wine. Both Bordeaux and Bowen uh, had a, a, a celebration. And I can say from my experience, that's a nice thing to celebrate, um, uh, especially if you're going out into the countryside to try to interview uh, the heirs of the uh, uh, great estates. So I had that for a while. But all was not well in France. And here there were two fears. On the left, there was the fear of Bolshevism. And here is a nice looking uh, Bolshevik uh, with a bloodthirsty uh, expression on his face, uh, a knife between his teeth. Uh, and so the intensification of political uh, uh, poster making uh, uh, saw its way. Then there was also the famous, or I should say infamous, riots of February 6, 1934 uh, on the Place de la Concorde, uh, where they came very close to overthrowing the government. And this was one year after Hitler came to power uh, in France. So there was a fear uh, on the uh, uh, right of, Bolsh of um, uh, fascism uh, on the left. Uh, the fear was that of Bolshevism, and uh, uh, in between then, France was increasingly paralyzed uh, with these polar opposites then uh, contending uh, with, uh, uh, with one another. Um, here is an image then of one of the leagues, uh, which had some resemblance to the leagues that had been active in Germany. Uh, in the early 1930s. Uh, this is one uh, a shirted league uh, mm -hmm. at the Arc de Triomphe, of course, the great symbol of nationalism for France. And these are some of Colonel de la Roque's uh, uh, demonstrators, and he was looked upon as a potential threat uh, then to the stability of the Republic itself. So the Republic was seen to be in danger, uh, and this then led to uh, a rally on the part of the parties of the left, which included the Communist Party as well. And uh, they put together a popular front uh, to defend the Republic. Here they are at the Place de la République in eastern uh, Paris, um, uh, uh, celebrating uh, Bastille Day, July 14th, uh, in 1936, when this coalition then uh, came together, and there were protests, demonstrations then, uh, and, um, uh, and the like. But Hitler decided to do something about it. And he decided to march across the Rhineland, occupy the demilitarized area of the Rhineland with his troops. Uh, the troops are on the right. They looked formidable. But most of them were uh, firemen, policemen, dressed up in uniforms to make it look like the massive German uh, war machine was on the march in some sort of way. The French wanted to intervene at this point because it was a clear violation of the Treaty of Versailles. But when they went to their British friends, they got a no. They would not back them. Uh, in any kind of aggressive uh, uh, action taken then uh, against Hitler's remilitarization of the Rhineland. Here is a kind of pie-shaped thing to show you that the Popular Front, uh, uh, with the addition of the communist group at the bottom, uh, 
uh, 72 uh, uh, deputies elected, where there had, had only been 10 of them before. This touched off then an enormous panic that the Bolsheviks were going to take over France in some way. And I think it's from the popular front on that the politics of France becomes rather dramatically divided then between those, as they saw it, defending democracy and those who saw it as corrupt uh, and uh, dangerous to France. So that by the time of the 1937 World's Fair, uh, France was caught in the middle. On the left is a rather sinister looking bird at the top, uh, and on the right is the hammer and sickle of the Soviets, and France is somehow caught in between. So this takes us back to my point I made at the beginning, namely that by 1937-38, France is suffering from a severe crisis of where do they go, where do they find support, the British have already shown their reluctance to get too deeply involved, uh, and the like. Um, and so they are forced then uh, into a kind of appeasement. Here is the Munich conference with Neville Chamberlain on the left, the man who came back to London waving a piece of paper saying, I brought peace in our time. Uh, that does not uh, go over very well uh, these days. Uh, and then next to him is Deladier. Now I have to say, I wrote a couple of papers about poor old Deladier and I try to resuscitate him. But next to Deladier, of course, is Adolf Hitler, uh, Mussolini, and Mussolini's son-in-law uh, uh, to the side. They came back from Munich capitulating. That is, they gave the Germans the right to occupy um, uh, the um, uh, Sudetenland along the western border, which had a kind of Maginot-style defense then, and that uh, meant that they were now uh, quite uh, vulnerable. Uh, no one knew it uh, more, and that's why I kind of admire him, uh, than Deladier. Now, the rumor is that Deladier had a flask uh, of cognac in his pocket. He consumed it on the way back. He looked out of the plane as they circled over Le Bourget, the main uh, airport at the time, and he saw this enormous crowd lining the street all the way into Paris. And again, this is probably apocryphal, but he said, the damn fools, they're gonna lynch me. Uh, and I said, step off the plane. He didn't get lynched. Instead, they were cheering him just as he got, uh, Chamberlain got cheered in London for having brought peace in our time. But uh, Deladier knew better. And he began to step up uh, French arms production. He had to break with the Popular Front, which had put in a 40-hour work week. He said, no, the Germans are working 60 hours a week. We are going to match them and they began producing then a very impressive uh, uh, military potential, uh, but it was uh, too little and uh, too late, as we'll see now uh, in, uh, in just a moment. Instead, Hitler now marched into uh, Poland. Uh, the mobilization orders went up. And I put that mobilization order, uh, uh, which was hanging on the walls of much of uh, uh, the cities of Paris, of France, um, and, but I also put it next to the attitude of the people. They had been through one slaughter, and they knew this was going to come again. So it's a very sober, if you look at the pictures of 1914, everybody's going to go into Berlin in six weeks. Uh -huh. And uh, here now, they knew what they were really facing uh, when war, uh, war came. And war did come. They thought they had built their uh, impregnable Maginot line. And when you think about it, it was impregnable. No one took a, a fortification in the Maginot Line head on. They instead went around it because they now had remilitarized 
the part that was supposedly France's defense then, namely the demilitarized uh, Rhineland. And so now uh, they were facing a very serious problem. And we've been having fun at historical conferences arguing over, well, how did the French really do? For most of them, they were considered then very weak, having failed in a number of respects. But I have to say that my friend Phil Nord at um, Princeton uh, and uh, uh, also a uh, uh, historian at uh, uh, Harvard uh, who's written a book called Not Strange Defeat, but Strange Victory. And so here, let's have a little what if. What if the French thought that they were going to have a repeat of 1914 and the famous or infamous schlieffen Valen, which they had uh, stopped, installed, uh, leading then to uh, four years of trench uh, and very bloody warfare. Uh, but they didn't uh, really extend that Maginot line far enough. And so the Germans concentrated their forces um, uh, at Sedan, which had brought them victory in, 19, in uh, 1870. And it worked again uh, this particular uh, uh, time. But here we look at uh, what were the uh, balance of forces. The French had as many tanks as did the Germans. And they had de Gaulle preaching the virtues of war of mobility, but no one was quite listening to him. So the result was that on the upper, uh, uh, well, if you take the manpower count uh, with the British Expeditionary Force now coming over, uh, uh, this is to the left then, uh, yeah. Um, uh, they had equal manpower. But when it comes to tanks, they had equal numbers of tanks on each side. The problem was that the Germans had their tanks, as you can see in the 10 uh, images of the tanks on the right-hand side, they had mobile units. The French had slow but extremely well-armored uh, units. Uh, the Germans would fire at the French tanks and the shells would just bounce off of them. And they couldn't believe that, you know. Uh, but there were only two extant mobile units because, and they were slow. 15 miles an hour was faster than any soldier could run, so therefore you were supporting the soldiers, not the tanks. And the Germans decided uh, they had a different idea uh, in mind. So better mobility, a better eye uh, on what they might, uh, they might do. Um, uh, but so the trouble was that when they broke through Sedan in the lower end uh, of this uh, uh, image, uh, when they broke through with that large uh, pincer that's down almost to the bottom of the page, uh, they dashed then and in 10 days, they got from the Ardennes Forest, which no one thought they could get through, uh, up to the coast along the channel. So here was the thing, and now here we get to my little game of What If, which is the title of a book that Harold Deutsch and Showalter put together once. And you contributed. Oh, uh, well, yeah, but mine was pretty much fantasy. But in any case, uh, they uh, uh, made a dash to the coast, and the Germans themselves, Rundstedt, was after Guderian, and he said, stop, you're outrunning your supply line. And we know that's fatal. And it might have been fatal, because look at those two, three little arrows uh, coming up down here at the bottom. They were uh, a fourth tank, a mobile tank unit, commanded by General de Gaulle. Now, you look further up the line, and you see that the British tried a counterattack. What if? What if one had been next to the other? It might have been Guderian, trapped 
against the, the Channel Coast. So here is where, um, I wouldn't say we earn our pay, uh, but we certainly have fun trying to think of the possibilities that uh, uh, might, have, uh, uh, might have transpired. But here, again, there was an American, uh, uh, or I should say a French historian, uh, who wrote about the mistake that was made of going to the Breda variant. Now, you see there are uh, uh, long extensions are of arrows that run into uh, the Netherlands. That's the Breda variant, and they were some of the best units in the French army. But they were going that away, while the Germans were going that away. And so that was, I would argue, one of the most fatal mistakes tactically uh, that the French committed uh, uh, in this battle uh, of, um, of 19, uh, 1940. The result was that after uh, uh, about four days of pause, uh, Guderian decided he would get going anyway. He managed to uh, be at the front line, but it sounded like he was broadcasting from behind the line where Rundstedt thought he was uh, operating. Uh, and so he gambled, and he gambled and won. So that the uh, British were forced to take their uh, troops off the beach uh, at Dunkirk. Some French uh, went along with them, who became then part of uh, de Gaulle's uh, resistance uh, uh, forces in England, uh, and I'm sure many of you, I'll make a survey too. How many have seen the movie uh, Dunkirk? Ah, look at that. I mean, there, that's how we learn our history. Uh, and so uh, 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 this is then uh, uh, what took place. My own criticism of the Dunkirk operation is that the, there were private yachts that were just as important as those destroyers in getting the people off the beach. Who commanded those yachts? Civilians. civilians. What kind of civilians? Weekend. Women. So I really, you know, in this era of hashtag me too, uh, how they could make such a gaffe uh, on that, rather than they, they should have then, uh, said that these women uh, drove across. The result is de uh, Paris was declared an open city. Uh, the Germans uh, um, simply marched in without any real damage being uh, uh, experienced. Um, and this time they were entitled to their uh, march down the Champs-Élysées. Uh, which they had been, uh, uh, they had tried in 1871, uh, but this time again, like in 1871, uh, the French went indoors or simply sobbed. And that what they had lost, and they knew that the war, the game was over as far as France was, uh, uh, was concerned. What we don't see much of is what was the flight of civilians from northern and nor particularly northeastern France, which had been under German occupation. Now they all headed south, mainly towards Bordeaux. Uh, and uh, here are uh, families literally on the highway uh, trying to get out of the way. And it was not an easy task because the Germans bombed them with their dive bombers, the Stukas, along the road. Uh, and the losses were uh, severe. Uh, uh, of the five million, maybe uh, a third or 20% a, a, a of them uh, were victims then of the German air, uh, air attacks. Uh, they all ended up in, um, in Bordeaux. Uh, I can recommend on Netflix that you take out a French movie uh, called Bon Voyage. It has Gerard Depardieu, about 250 pounds lighter than he is at the present time, uh, made up to look like Deladier uh, as the hero of this uh, farce. And you get a glimpse of de Gaulle taking a flight and to England, uh, ready to carry on uh, the resistance. 
this then is the uh, result of their flight uh, with uh, a kind of despair. Uh, it's a beaten country. Uh, and uh, much in this way, the Germans have advanced uh, across the Loire River and into southern, uh, southern France. The Germans allowed them to divide the country in such a way uh, that um, uh, the coastlines were held by the Germans. Uh, they also had a military zone, the kind of purple corner, uh, and another uh, strip uh, uh, that was militarily um, uh, administrated. But otherwise, the French were allowed to set up uh, a temporary capital, uh, uh, which many of them hoped would be the permanent capital, at Vichy, France, that became willing to collaborate with Germany, thinking the Germans had won, and now it's time for us to join Hitler in his new order. And this then produced what would be uh, a terrible division. Here uh, on the right-hand side, uh, they're checking you had to have a pass to go from the unoccupied to the occupied zone uh, of Germany, uh, the unoccupied zone being the blue area uh, with Vichy uh, uh, in the south, uh, and with the own coastline being uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, the rest of it then was under German military rule for all intents and purposes, uh, and this then created uh, another division uh, in France. Here is the final separation, uh, the line that uh, ran up uh, uh, behind the uh, uh, West Atlantic coast, across then France to the Swiss border, uh, and that was then the southern France, the poorer part of France, it has to be said, uh, that was left then to the, um, uh, to the Vichy uh, government. But it became a collaborationist government. Here is a picture of them at the Hotel du Parc in Vichy. Now, why did they move to a, an obscure place like Vichy? Well, the answer was, that unlike the French military in uh, the Battle of France, uh, it had excellent communications. Um, if they had fought then, uh, uh, maybe their battles uh, in with this kind of equipment, they might have done better. But they didn't, so they took up residence in this Hotel du Parc. There were chickens running up and down the aisles. There was all kind of chaos that went on. Uh, but here then, the, those who felt that uh, France had lost the war and there was nothing to be done but then to make the best of it, uh, to get on then with uh, rebuilding France um, in some way. Well, what about Britain? Britain was still there and here then the German uh, soldiers uh, show up on the banks of the uh, channel, looking across at the white cliffs of Dover and thinking about an invasion. But now the contrast is where I get sometimes fun in presenting how the Allies prepared for their cross-channel invasion with the way in which the Germans did not really um, uh, get down to brass tacks. They had no plan for a cross-channel invasion. Goering assured him, uh, Hitler, that uh, he could knock the British Air Force out of the sky. That didn't quite work out as planned. And just to show you how little prepared they really were, uh, here they began to get landing craft, scraping barges from all over Europe, and that is how they planned for their D-Day. Not so good. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, the British uh, uh, did a pretty good job of bombing these uh, uh, barges and attacking where they could. And of course, we know they ultimately won the Battle uh, of Britain. Uh, but here then, uh, uh, Marshal Pétain made his infamous handshake with Hitler, uh, saying that uh, while France was neutral, it would be uh, sympathetic uh, to the German project then of remaking Europe. 
of resistance cartoon is on the right with Hitler riding poor old Marshal Pétain around the block here. Uh, and that became then uh, the symbol of Vichy. This one then is what was called the National Revolution. The old order, that is the Republic, is the one that is crumbling then on the right-hand side and they're going to rebuild a new, sturdier France out of the ruins of defeat, uh, which was laid at the doorstep uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the Third Republic, uh, considered decadent and the like. But of course, there was one man who didn't agree with this. This was de Gaulle. He made his famous speech from London. We always have a nice little debate over a certain amount of wine as to how many people were listening to that speech. Uh, the top score is maybe 5,000. Nobody listened to de Gaulle. No one paid him any attention. He had no land base. He was known sarcastically as de Gaulle the landless. Gradually, he began to rally some of the French empire uh, to, his, uh, uh, to his cause but it would take him at least two to three years to do that. Also, the resistance began to take shape by 1943. Uh, there was a sign of internal resistance uh, that also contributed then to the cause. But there were really two Frances. Two Frances symbolized uh, by these flags on the left is the Vichy, uh, and some would say almost uh, Mussolini style a uh, fascist symbol then. Uh, on the right was de Gaulle, who wisely picked uh, the uh, uh, Cross of Lorraine uh, as his symbol, um, uh, overlooking the fact that the Cross of Lorraine um, uh, was the Maid of Orléans, who had fought the British, not the Germans. <laughs> so uh, there were always a little uh, troubles there. Uh, that loomed in the, uh, in the background. Uh, but there were authentic fascists in France. Uh, one of them uh, was Jacques Doriot. Jacques Doriot had been a very ardent, radical member of the Communist Party in the early 1930s. He completely flip-flopped to the other side, uh, and he became the symbol then of fascism then uh, 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 in terms of Vichy's uh, 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 politics then. And then what they tried to do was to rally the French for its crusade against Bolshevism. So we get back to the quarrels of the 1930s of a France that was badly divided and how were they going to get out of it? Well, you'll have to come back on to collaboration and resistance, which is the next chapter. So thank you very much for listening patiently. Any questions along the way here? What was the impact of the pan-endemic influenza on both France and Germany? Yeah, um, here there were no borders. I mean, you know, they, uh, they crossed it. I lost a grandfather in that uh, pandemic in good old Southern California. Um, so there was no real defense against it. We have a couple of dissertations that were done at the U on precisely that, and the losses were astronomical, just as bad as the losses I showed you this way. I've forgotten what she came up with in her dissertation, yeah. Both, both countries are about equal? But about equal, yeah. And uh, it was supposedly... Um, it was a, a, an epidemic that came in from the east, and it swept into now ravaged Europe, uh, but it also hit Americans, too, and, and particularly those Americans. Uh, my wife's uh, uncle uh, were on a troop ship going back because they had been, well, first been gassed and then acquired uh, uh, influenza as well. I had a quick question. What? Okay. Okay. Now, in hindsight, we call them World War One and World War Two, and I've heard World War One referred to as the Great War. But when does the nomenclature World War One and World War Two? When does that pop up, and what did they call the Second World War before it became World War Two? Before II? it became, it was called the Great War. Uh, 
and that was, uh, that was its nomenclature. It still often is referred to as the Great War in some ways, but in terms of scale, of course, World War II was, uh, and was more authentically uh, a worldwide conference, uh, or a conflict, I should say, uh, uh, in a global sense. That's why I dragged in Japan on this, to show you that this was, was a global war, but the imbalance between losses was uh, uh, enormous there. Well, one issue that's come up, Dr. McCollum, has been the uh, impact on the French of the British bombing of the fleet at Toulon and also the civilian losses uh, in the air campaign against the Germans. Yeah. Could you comment on the impact of that? Well, the impact was severe because it was at Mers el Kaber. Uh, what was the question? Uh, he, oh, I'm sorry. He said, what was the impact of the fact that the British uh, uh, attacked the French fleet that was located in North Africa? And it was Mers el Kaber was the port just outside of uh, Algiers. And that was severe because they said our allies have become traitors. And so Vichy made good use, or well, a use of that uh, 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 claim then that uh, the British were uh, faithless uh, Britain, uh, which they had had in their bag of tricks for three, four hundred years, something like that. Question here. Yeah. I have a strange question for you. I never read much about what happened in French Indochina. The Japanese are fighting the French in Indochina. The Germans are fighting the French in France. Yeah. I, I never under, could understand that. Uh, well, um, the, the answer was that uh, the French in Indochina went with Vichy. The French in New Caledonia went with de Gaulle. So that's where I got interested in this, because I couldn't figure out why did de Gaulle and Roosevelt have such a terrible time getting along with each other? I mean, they're fighting on the same side, they're trying to accomplish the same goal, and so I set out to look at various places where they were together. And I started with New Caledonia, and it turned out to be so comical that I couldn't let go of it. <laughs> well, didn't Eisenhower have the strange relationship with de Gaulle in England? He had a, a good relationship. Oh, he did? Yeah. Uh, I've often thought that maybe, you know, there's um, Churchill and de Gaulle, uh, Roosevelt and de Gaulle. Eisenhower and de Gaulle is worth looking into because Eisenhower, after he retired as president, uh, wrote a document that I've got saying, you know, my relations with de Gaulle were always very good. And I sometimes show in the second part of this, uh, de Gaulle and Eisenhower with de Gaulle telling Eisenhower, no, God damn it, we're going into Paris. <laughs> I don't care if you want to go around it. But, uh, uh, he and, and Eisenhower got along fairly well when they got into North Africa. And Roosevelt said he wanted Eisenhower to impose something that's called AMGOT. It's an acronym for Allied Military Government of Occupied Territories. Well, just as soon as de Gaulle heard that, it's going to be, France is going to be treated as an occupied territory by the Allies? No, no. And so he went to uh, Eisenhower in Algiers, as they were planning, of course, for D-Day. And uh, Eisenhower looked at him and he said, well, I'll show you a letter I've just written to Roosevelt. He said, if you insist that we impose a military government on occupied territory in North Africa, I will carry out your orders and then I will resign my commission and go back to being a lieutenant colonel. Roosevelt stopped at that and he said, oh, you can go ahead. Then when they went into Normandy, uh, there was again going to be another military government established. And Eisenhower wrote back to Roosevelt, I'm not going to waste my officers' 
administering territory. They're to fight. They're here to defeat the enemy. And uh, I'm not going to do it. And once again, Roosevelt surrendered. Uh, hi. Uh, could you uh, speak for a minute about the different divisions within the Free French Alliance? Because I know, you know, de Gaulle himself is a rather conservative figure, but a large uh, amount of the fighters uh, like in occupied France were actually communists. The communists, yeah. And there are also the colonial faction of the Free French Army, the Moroccans, the Algerians, a lot of them yeah. were felt that they weren't treated fairly by the Free French you know, commanding. So could you just elaborate on the divisions within? The well, there were, there were divisions because the uh, uh, Free French forces and, and particularly de Latre's First French Army um, were mostly Moroccans, Algerians, and the like. And you've probably seen uh, uh, movies about how badly they were treated then at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the war. Worse yet, they talked about, Delatre especially, talked about the need for whitening the French army. You see, because there were sub-Saharan African troops from Senegal, there were troops, you know, of color. And they, uh, they deliberately said, we have to show that we are a white army. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't get into the newspapers. Uh, but in any case, that, uh, uh, that, that was definitely there because, and if you look at the Italian campaign and the bombing of Monte Cassino, it was really the French that went around Monte Cassino and won that battle, you see. So they were good fighters, and, and there's not, that's not the question. Uh, the question is, what kind of an impression is the uh, army going to have? Now, as far as the divisions within the resistance, yes, the um, communists were a very strong part of that. De Gaulle very wisely parachuted a man called Jean Moulin back into uh, France at the beginning of 1942. And Moulin was a socialist. So he got away from some of this idea that this is just another conservative military officer, or as Roosevelt would call him, a, a Napoleon in the wings, you know, so forth and so on. So here, uh, that gave different colorings to the resistance movement. And uh, Moulin, uh, because he had, was a man of the left, was able to then appeal to the communists to recognize de Gaulle as the leader of the resistance, uh, resistance movement. But it got to be a dicey issue on the liberation of Paris because most of that was carried out by the communists who had gotten infiltrated into the Paris police. And this was what de Gaulle was worried about. So I show in the second part of this deal, I show the picture of de Gaulle down on the uh, porch of the uh, Hotel de Ville, cheering on the French people, Paris liberated by itself, Paris liberated in this way. And then he goes to Eisenhower and he says, could you have the 4th Division march through Paris? <laughs> in other words, uh, we got to keep uh, Colonel Paul uh, 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 Tanguy. Uh, under control here, or we're going to have a real revolution maybe at the end of the war. And there again is another theme of mine uh, about how the uh, French used wars to carry out revolutions. And, uh, Does that answer your question? Is it? Yeah. Okay. And uh, one of the things that I recall from the Versailles 1919 was the lack of uh, dealing with uh, Vietnam or French Indochina at that time, yeah. and we did a program on that. But uh, to, to answer Chris's question about uh, North Africa, the program we did last October was on Torch by Vince O'Hara, and it is on YouTube. So if you want to look at that program, uh, he explains a lot of that. Uh, sir, yes. uh, thank you for coming. This is oh, a my little word. gadget box. Yeah. With your name on it? Will it explode if I open it? No, no, no. That that's o that's only in Washington. Oh, okay. 
But thank you for coming. <laughs> At uh, least you didn't put it in a tube. Thank you very much. <laughs> Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.